So good to see you guys. Did you like that last song? Two, two lines I wanted to, to uh, touch on. Sin, no ha sin has no hold on me because your grace holds me now. Isn't that good? And, and then this line, it's only sung once, but man, it gets to the, to the heart uh, of our faith. Grace runs as deep as your scars. That's talking about Christ, the scars of Christ. And he's the reason we're here today. He's the reason we sing. He's the reason we worship. He's the reason the Avenue Church exists. Jesus came to earth 2,000 years ago, the, the Son of God, the divine Son of God. He lived a perfect, sinless life. He went to the cross, and on the cross, he bore my sin, he bore your sin. And he didn't just bear our sin, he, was, he received the full wrath of God poured out for your sin and my sin. And then he rose from the grave three days later. And because of who he is and what he did for us, we can receive that grace, that grace of forgiveness, that grace of healing, that grace of life abundant and eternal. That's awesome. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's, that's uh, why uh, we are here. My name is John Hicks. If, if uh, you haven't seen me yet, um, I'm not Casey. You're like, like who's this guy? I, I thought there's this. No, I'm, I'm not him. I'm a, a new pastor at uh, the Av. I'm the care and discipleship pastor. I've been here all of, uh, I don't know, two months, two and a half, oh, two and a half months. So uh, really new, really, really uh, green, uh, if you will. And uh, Casey and I are, are a little different, just a little. Why is that so funny? Why? You guys, oh. He, uh, for, for example, um, he's got a really cool name. Casey Cleveland. Good, good job, John, Don and Becky. Great, great. My name is John Hicks. I, I really hope my mom's not watching on, on the live stream today. Um, I love my name, Mom. Where's the camera? Is that the camera? I love, love my name, Mom. I really do. I really do. Um, Casey, uh, let's see what else. I have a long list, but I'll, I'll shorten it. Um, he dresses really cool. This is just me, you know? Um, Casey likes to jump off the stage. I don't even jump out of bed, all right? This is it's not, it's not safe. But we have, we have a lot of things in common. One, we both married way over our head. Amen. Amen. Yeah. That's good. Really good. We, we, we both are way in over our head with kids. I mean, that's... That's real, and, and we both know and love Jesus, and we want you to know and love Jesus too. And that's what this is about. Anyone know what our current sermon series is? That's it. Greater Imitation. It's about you and me who know and love Jesus inviting those who don't know and love Jesus to come to know and love Jesus. That, that's the greater invitation. And that's the greatest invitation you can extend to one. And I love this quote. Um, I think it's next. Let's bring that up. It's coming. Here we go. I, don't, I have no idea who D.T. Niles is, but I love what he said. He said, evangelism is just one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. Isn't that good? So that's what this series is about. It's about what, what some old school language here, personal evangelism. Does, does that sound familiar to anyone? Personal evangelism. If you've grown up in church, you've probably heard that. Uh, personal, we know what that means, right? One-on-one -on -one kind of thing. Evangelism is a theological word that means good news. Good news. So personal evangelism is you and me who know Jesus telling those who don't the good news about Jesus the greater invitation. Now that sounds really simple, right? Does that look really simple? Is it really simple? Is, is it difficult to tell others about Jesus? How, how many of you it's, it's difficult to tell others about Jesus? How many of you are like, it's easy, do it all the time, no problem? See, I'm really jealous of you. Uh, my wife just raised her hand. You know, I'm really jealous. For, for a lot of Christians, it's, it's so hard to go tell other people 
about Jesus. And so this series is about um, encouraging and equipping us so we can do that better. And Casey's brought some great messages about that. He's talked about our story and, and how, how the gospel story comes into ours and Jesus becomes the hero of our story. Uh, last week, uh, I caught the end of the message last week, really good message about listening to people and their story. So we can enter into their story and, and show them how Jesus can become the hero of their story too. So really good skills on, on helping us learn how to tell others about Jesus. Today I'm going to share with you a, really more of a concept that I hope will be beneficial um, in, in helping you be that kind of person, one beggar telling another beggar where to find food. So our scripture today is in the uh, book of Luke. If you have your Bibles, whether you prefer paper or plastic, you know, your phones, uh, pull up your app or open your scripture to Luke chapter 5. It's in the, in the New Testament, or you can look on screen here. Those will be the, uh, they'll be up there too. But the title of this message is Food, Friends, and Jesus. Food, Friends, and Jesus. And our scripture is Luke 5. So I'll give you a chance to uh, get there. When you get there, say amen or, or winner or something. All right. And if you're just looking, you beat all of us there. So Good job. That's right. Yes. Luke 5. You guys ready? Down in verse 27. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector. Everyone say boo. All right. There's more to this story, but that, there's no IRS agents here, are there? I'm going to be audited, aren't I? I'm going to be in so much trouble. Um, after this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house. And a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees... The Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors, say boo, and sinners? Jesus answered them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to gather today. I thank you for the, the gift of, of song and music that, that helps us uh, join our, our heads and our hearts in, in worship to you. And, and we pray that your Holy Spirit would continue to fill this place. And, and may you be our master teacher today as we look at your word. Lord, I pray you, you would speak through me and also in spite of me, uh, touch hearts here, change lives um, I pray for those who don't yet know Jesus, that they would come to know Jesus. And Father, I pray that all of us would step out and start pointing people to Jesus for your glory. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Um, if, you, if you have your little program thingy, there's a place to follow along in there with notes. Um, that, that's a helpful guide. Um, if I wander, it keeps me on track. If if, uh, if you get confused, keeps you on track, it's really helpful. Um, those same notes will be on the screen with, with blanks filled in. Um, as I, as I you know, worked through this passage uh, this week, I, I, I went back and forth on how best to organize. I like to organize things so, so it makes them you know, clearer to me and, and hopefully clear to you as well. I decided to break it up into two main headings. The first heading, here's the, ready, this is a great heading. You ready? Point number one, background. Is that genius or what? Background. And so everything under point number one is some really important background about this passage. There's so much stuff in here that, that it's when we understand the background, it's like, whoa, this is amazing what's going on. So I want to make sure you get the background of this passage. And then we're going to come to point number two in a little bit. Any guesses what point number two is? Application. Is that awesome or what? I work long and hard on those headings. So background, I want to give you three areas under background. We're going to look first of all at the religious leaders, the religious leaders 
Uh, there were the Pharisees and the teachers of the law and, and some, other, some other people. When we think about religious leaders today, who do we think of? Like preachers, Pre- teachers, priests, maybe the Pope, you know, guys like you know, Billy Graham, you know, religious leaders, okay? A lot of these leaders are awesome. Some, you know, there's some also not so hot religious leaders out there. Well, the religious leaders during that time were not the best. Any fans of Saturday Night Live here? Remember when it used to be funny back in the 80s? <laughs> Remember? The greats, Phil Hartman, you know, those guys were awesome. Michael Myers, he, he was fun. And Dana Carvey. Don't you wish he was still like, he's like hiding or something. Remember, it's probably his most famous character. Church Church lady. (laughs) I will spare you my impersonation of church lady. (laughs) These guys were kind of like the church lady. They they saw, they were were holier than thou. They, They saw themselves as the protectors and the preservers of the faith and all that is right and true. Now, now some things were good about them. They, they thought they were being faithful to God's Word. They wanted to make sure that, that, that God's Word was taught, and, and, and spe- specifically the Old Testament and the first five books of the Old Testament. They really wanted to be faithful. But what happened is some, some religious tradition crept in that wasn't true. Some, some cultural things crept in that were unhealthy. And, and, and they became some really just awful people. I want to share this, this quote with you from, from uh, um, Brennan Manning, the Ragamuffin Gospel. He summarizes the religious leaders of the day. In, in first century Palestinian Judaism, that's what we're talking about, first century Palestinian Judaism, the class system was enforced rigorously. It was legally forbidden to mingle with sinners who were outside of the Old Testament law. Table fellowship or sharing a meal with beggars or tax collectors and prostitutes was religiously, socially, and culturally taboo. So, so here's what the Pharisees and the other religious leaders did. They, they basically thought they had figured everything out they, they had all the right beliefs and all the right behaviors. And if you were not just like them in, in what you believed and what you did, they had no time for you. In fact, they would ostracize you. Furthermore, if you hung out with people who were not exactly like you, like them, they didn't have time for you. It was an extreme legalism. It was, it was mean-spirited religion at its worst. They were, they were condescending, condemning. Just a harsh crowd. Now, imagine for a moment what it must have been like for everybody else if you weren't just like these guys. What it was like to be not them. Instead, the ones who were looked down upon didn't believe exactly right or didn't know what they believed or didn't behave exactly right. Pretty rough scenario. So that, that's the first piece of background. Here's the second piece of background. We have Levi and the other tax collectors Levi and the other tax collectors and sinners. Um, I, I kind of teased about IRS agents. Um, this goes way beyond the IRS agent. Um, at this time in, in Jewish history, um, Israel was under the Roman Empire. So you had the Israelites living, living in, in the Holy Land, but a foreign occupier had come in and was ruling over them. The tax collectors were normally Jewish men who had purchased from Rome the right to collect taxes and and tolls and customs. Furthermore, they collected more than was required by law, and Rome was fine with them doing that as long as they brought to Rome what Rome demanded. 
So these guys were, were greedy, they were dishonest, they were disloyal. They even took more money from the poor than they should have. So can you imagine what it was like to be a tax collector in this day? Not exactly on anybody's list of, hey, I want to be their friend, right? So if you're in that situation as tax collectors, who's going to hang out with you and who are you going to hang out with? <laughs> Other tax collectors and anyone else that's kind of the bottom of society, if you will, prostitutes, homeless, other sinners, they kind of, they were couched in that term of, of sinners. So on the one hand, you had the, the upper crust, which was the religious elite. They had all the power. They had all the respect. They, they had it all together, supposedly, the, the top rung of the social ladder. On the other hand, you, you had the bottom rung of the social ladder, the down and outers, those who were spiritually and morally and socially reprobate, if you will. That's what's going on here. And that brings us to the third piece of background. Enter Jesus. <laughs> Don't you love it when Jesus shows up? <laughs> so with this background in mind, let's, let's uh, go back to our Scripture. I want us to read it again so, so you can see it in light of the background. So Luke 5, once again, verse 27. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector, someone Jesus shouldn't have anything to do with, okay? He saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, he said to him. And Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Then Levi had a great banquet for Jesus at his house. And guess who he invited to the banquet? Everyone else Jesus shouldn't be hanging around with. A large crowd of tax collectors and others who were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples, why do you eat and drink, tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but the unrighteous to repentance. Notice what happens here. First thing, Jesus calls Levi to follow him. Okay, this, this was a very specific, unique call. This was not like you and me saying, hey, let's, let's go, you know, grab a bite. This, this was Jesus calling Levi to be a disciple. Jesus was a rabbi, okay, a teacher, esteemed and so, rabbis in that day, whenever they called someone to be the disciple, their disciple, they chose the cream of the crop. Was Levi the cream of the crop? No. He was sour milk. And Jesus said, hey, come follow me. Be my disciple. And that so moved Levi, his heart, that he's like, you bet. And he left everything to follow Jesus. But it didn't start, it didn't stop there. Uh, Levi went and threw a party for Jesus. I love this part. He threw a party for Jesus. Now, let, let's be honest here. If you have a very special, highly esteemed guest of honor coming to your house, is your guest list going to be a little selective? Who did Levi invite? Tax collectors other sinners, down and outers to, to hang with him. And, and he was cool about it. It was like Levi was saying to his friends, listen, you've heard of this Jesus guy. He just showed up. He's the newest rabbi in town. He's doing these miracles, and he's called me to be his disciple. That's crazy. I know. I shouldn't be his disciple. you got to come meet this guy. So we're going to have a party at my place. And all his rowdy friends, for you country music fans, all his rowdy friends came and joined him. 
And then one more little piece of background before we, we move to our application section. In this day, when you shared a meal with someone, okay, in this day, when you shared a meal with someone, you were saying to them, I'm your friend. I have, have relational intimacy with you. We're close. You're my people. And so Jesus, by accepting the invitation to Levi's place, and, and Jesus, by staying there with all that rowdy crowd there, he was saying to them, hey, guys, I love you. I'm for you. I know you're messed up, but that's okay with me. I'm not embarrassed to be seen with you. You're my people. And that explains why the Pharisees were like, who is this Jesus? How can he do that? So that's the background. That's just the background. Is there, is there some good stuff in the background? There's a lot of good stuff in there. So let's start to unpack it. Point number two. Here we go. Application. Application. Number one. Number one under this. We all need Jesus. We all need Jesus, no matter how righteous or unrighteous we think we are. How many of you, as I described, the uh, Pharisees and religious leaders were getting a little ticked off at them? Anybody getting ticked off at those guys? Yeah, I was. Uh, as, I, as I prepared and studied and soaked in this, I'm like, these guys are the biggest jerks. They're just jerks. But then as I continued to, to sit there and let the Holy Spirit uh, speak to my heart, um, God reminded me that sometimes I'm a jerk too. In my pride, I can, I can look down on others who aren't like me, others who, who I, I don't think are, are as far along spiritually as they should be, maybe others who don't believe exactly like, like I do. So on the one hand, I was, I was like, these are, guys are awful. On the other hand, I was like, oh, I don't want to be like them. And God reminded me that we all need Jesus. Every single one of us, no matter how high on the social ladder we might think we are, or how low on the social ladder we might think we are, no matter how much we think we've arrived in whatever facet of life or, or haven't arrived, we all need Jesus. Look at this scripture up here from Romans 3. Paul wrote, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us, all of us, and are justified. You know what that word justified means? It means declared righteous. Declared righteous. We are declared righteous freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. All of us. Whether you might fall into the, the Pharisee crowd or fall into the tax collector crowd or somewhere in between, we all need Jesus. Amen? Amen. All of us. Here's a, a second big takeaway that, that the Lord impressed upon my heart, and really was, this was eye-opening for me, life-changing for me. Jesus invites us to be his disciples and his, say it with me, friends. 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 And, and the rest of our time this morning, we're going to kind of soak in that concept of friendship. The call that, that Jesus extended to Levi began with discipleship. He said, come follow me. That's discipleship. We're called to follow Jesus. But it, it included friendship. It wasn't just being a disciple. It was also being his friend. Let's look at this scripture. This points it out really nice. This is when Jesus is in the upper room. It's the night before he's crucified. He's hanging out with his closest followers, spending some really tender moments with them, preparing them for what's to come. And he says to them, you are my friends if you do what I command. That's, that's the discipleship part. Disciples follow Jesus and obey Jesus. But he says, you are my friends. That's part of that. And then he says, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends. For everything that I've learned from the Father, I have made known to you. Friends, Jesus calls us not only to discipleship, but also 
to friendship. Does that stir anyone's heart when you think about Jesus wanting to be your friend? Just think about that for a minute. He wants to be your friend. You know, I've been doing this Christian thing a long time, and, and you know, I understand that Jesus is the Son of God. He bore my sin, so he's my, he's my Lord. He's my Savior. I mean, I've had that here and here forever, but the idea of him wanting me to be his friend and him wanting to be my friend, that takes it to a different level for me. Friendship. Jesus wants to be a friend to you like he was to Levi and to Levi's friends. Anyone struggle with making friends? You don't have to raise your hand if you don't want to. I mean, it's like, yes. I, 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 I preached as, as, as a guest preacher here in February, and I talked a lot about being a shy introvert. So that's, that's kind of me. It's like, ugh. Jesus wants to be my friend. He's pursuing me in that friendship. That's awesome. And I, as I was, you know, meditating on this for personal reasons, here's, here's, or just personally, here's what I felt the Lord was saying to me, and I'll, I'll just share this with you. John, I want to be your friend. Yes, John, I am your Savior and Lord. Yes, John, I want you to be my disciple And yes, I've called you to be a pastor, but I also want friendship with you. And yes, John, I know that you're a sinner and broken, and we're going to work on that together. But I still want to be your friend. And yes, John, I do know you're a little weird sometimes. (laughs) You weren't supposed to laugh at that. That really... (laughs) But my grace covers that too. So I, I don't know where you are today in, 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 on your spiritual journey. You know, maybe you've been walking with Jesus a long time. Maybe you've just started walking with him. Maybe you're not walking with him yet. Part of the gospel is he wants to be your friend. He knows your sin. He knows your brokenness. He knows your hurts and your wounds. Maybe you've been wounded by a friend and you're like, I don't want to be anybody's friend. He knows all that. He knows you're odd sometimes. He still wants to be your friend. Let that, let that work on you this week. And so a third thing today that we see in, in this passage, and I, and I encourage you to do this, be, be a friend to others as Jesus is to you. And all that entails, be that kind of friend to others. And be a friend to others as Levi was to his friends. We we see in this story such a beautiful expression of true friendship. Jesus showed true friendship in that he, he called Levi, warts and all, to be his friend. And he accepted Levi's invitation to go to his home and hang out with his friends. And and Jesus loved and accepted his friends. Ever been rejected because of your friends? It happens. Jesus showed amazing friendship here, and Levi showed amazing friendship. What did did Levi do? Levi, first of all, he fed his friends. Amen? Friendship? Friendship? You feed your friends. You go to eat with your friends. But most importantly, Levi wanted to make sure that his friends met Jesus. That's, that's, that's the biggest thing a friend can do for another friend is introduce them to Jesus. You guys want to do a little group participation here uh, this morning? Yeah. All right. If you're a shy introvert, your answer is no. <laughs> um, so this, this is easy level group participation. And online, we want to invite our people online to do this too. You can like text in your answers. Um, I want you to think about what are good friends? What, what is it that makes a good friend a good friend? What do they do? What, what are they? What do they do for you? What do they do with you? 
what are good friends? So I'm going to give you 10 seconds approximately, and then I'm going to let you yell out what good friends do and are, okay? Ready, set, go. 10 seconds, and then we'll hold on. Yeah. And remember, we're live on... I'm really not keeping time. I lost track, but it's, it's almost been 10 seconds, so I think we're there. Good friends, what are they? What do they do? All right, good. I got all that. Okay. I should have said one at a time, but how do, how do you do that? So think, you've got the idea. We know what good friends are, right? We know what good friends are. Good friends spend time with each other. They, they talk to each other. They eat together. They they commiserate together. They, they fight for each other. They sometimes fight with each other. They make up. They get up in the middle of the night for each other. You have a 2.30 friend you can call. They're going to be there. Good friends. They engage in meaningful conversation. And ultimately, good friends point people to the most important friend, Jesus. So be a friend to others that Jesus is to you and that Levi was to his friends. I've been meeting some of our neighbors, and, and uh, it's, it's kind of cool to live in an actual neighborhood. Um, I've been pastoring a long time, but I've always lived in a, in a church parsonage that was kind of on the church grounds. It was an island in a community. I never really met my neighbors unless my dog got loose and scared one, you know? And so it's kind of cool meeting, meeting my neighbors, and, and it's easy to meet neighbors when you have three awesome little girls, you know? It's just an easy way to meet neighbors. Um, I was talking to a neighbor just this past week uh, and um, got to know him. I'd already met his, his mom and his daughter and his dog, and, and finally got to meet him and and struck up a conversation. And actually, he reached out to me, which is cool. So we started talking, and, and as we were sharing, he asked that question I hate. He asked me what I do for a living. That's usually a conversation killer, you know? And, uh, and then he said, oh, boy, I guess I better watch my language. You know, that's, that, often, that often follows. Um, but we, the conversation continued. We had a good conversation and, and uh, got to know each other a little bit. And and uh, right now he's working on fixing up his house. They're wanting to sell their house and, and uh, move um, away. And, and uh, it's going to be a several-month thing. But anyway, I said to him, I said, listen, if, if you need help, I'm, I'm here to help you fix up your house. And I meant that sincerely because that's what friends do, right? I want to become this guy's friend and ultimately point him to Jesus. Levi. That's what he did. And if he cusses up a storm, I don't care. Doesn't bother me. You can cuss in front of me. I don't bother me. It's not about that. Friendship. This is, uh, this is, Free here. I just uh, happened to come across this last night or yesterday. There's something called the UCLA Loneliness Scale. Has anyone heard of that before? Uh, evidently, it's a big study that, that's done. It's reputable. Um, they update it periodically. Um, doctors use it. Healthcare professionals use it. They, they interview 20,000 or survey 20,000 people. So that's a big study if you've, if you've done any of that. Um, and what they're finding is that loneliness is epidemic in our culture. So I want to I share some stats with you about loneliness. First one is this. One in five people report that they rarely or never feel close to people. One in five. Or feel like there are people they can talk to. 20%. One out of five. That's like one, we got what, five sections? One, two, three, yeah. Slice off one section. Lonely. One in four Americans rarely or never feel as though others really understand them. Don't we want to be understood? 25% of the U.S. population, they don't, 
but they don't feel that they have anyone they can talk to who really gets them. Two out of five Americans sometimes or always feel that their relationships are not meaningful and that they are isolated from others. 40%. Nearly half of Americans report sometimes or always feeling alone or left out. Nearly half. And this one shocked me. I couldn't believe it. Generation Z, that's adults ages 18 to 22. They're the loneliest generation, according to this survey. The loneliest. Translation, what an opportunity we have to befriend those who are lonely and to point them to the greatest friend they'll ever know. Amen? Amen. Amen. So do you know someone who doesn't know Jesus? You, you work with them, you live next door to them, you recreate with them. The, the challenge is this today, to become their friend, a real friend. A real friend. And ultimately, point them to the best friend. I want to close with this quote from Francis Chan. Have you guys heard of him? Not, not Jackie. I always want to call him Jackie. It's Francis. He's a, he's a uh, well-known speaker, leader, writer, pastor in, in Christianity. This is a quote that haunts me in a good way. He says, Our greatest fear should not be of failure, but of succeeding at things in life that don't really matter. So, and I, I would modify it, succeeding at things in life that don't really matter eternally. Th think about the Av. I love the Av Church. I'm so glad to be here. It's, it's refreshing for for me to be on staff with, with just a great group of guys and gals and, and an awesome church. You guys are awesome. And I love what the Av does. I love the culture of the Av. When, when, when Allie and I started dating, she was on staff here, and, and uh, I wanted to, you know, see what kind of church she was a part of. And so, you know, I studied the culture of the Av and, and all that the Av is involved in just to make sure she wasn't crazy. And, and uh, <laughs> I learned she is crazy, but it's a great church. It's a great church. And, you know... She married me. That's crazy. <laughs> I, uh, so I, I, I you know, learned everything I could about the Av and saw the things that the, the Av's involved in, the ministries, the, the culture. I'm like, this is awesome. We're, 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 church, we're doing so many things, and we have such a, a neat culture that's unique and so life-giving in, in so many ways. And, and the most important part of that, that we must never lose sight of. The, the, the thing that matters most is pointing people to Jesus. That's the why, the ultimate why of the Avenue Church, Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. So today as we close, I want to invite the, uh, the prayer partners to come up and the worship team to uh, come on up. We're going to have our time of... Um, Time for you to respond, and a time for you to receive prayer. Here's, here's my greater invitation to you today, okay? It's, it's threefold. One, if you need prayer for anything, come on up. Our prayer partners want to pray for you, pray with you. Okay, so that's number one. Number two, if you haven't received Christ into your life yet, He's calling out to you as he called out to Levi to, to come and be his disciple and also be his friend. If the Lord is stirring in your heart, come forward, talk to the prayer partner, say, hey, I, I, want, I want this Jesus guy in my life. And then number three, will you commit today to be a friend to others? 
as Jesus is to you and as Levi was to his friend. You might want to come and ask for prayer in that. Pray for holy boldness, courage, wisdom, opportunities. Let's start a a Jesus friendship revolution in our town. So let's stand. Let me pray for us one more time, and our prayer partners will be up here. Father, thank you for this time. I pray that your spirit would continue to move in our hearts. I pray for those who don't yet know Jesus, that you would would draw them to yourself, continue to pursue them. And Father, I pray for all of us who who do know Jesus, that you would would compel us to befriend those who don't, that we might introduce them to you for your glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.